Um, and Jeff touched on some really good things this morning about how you get people into your clinic. How do you get people in to see you? How do you get bums on seats? But the next bit is, how do you get hearing aids on, the, hearing aids on those bums? All right. <laughs> yeah. Think of, <laughs> well, you know, if you're doing it that way, you might be doing it wrong. <laughs> he also touched on the idea of, of inconsistency, sort of de deteriorates your brand. Okay. So for me, a really important thing when someone arrives in your clinic and they get in that room with you is that, that you're the best that you can be for them. Okay. And that. That's really all about every aspect of your, your, your consultation. And this one, we're going to look at measuring hearing, okay, as, a, as a, a really essential part of this customer's journey, okay. Um, so the assessment is your first opportunity, really, to get things right clinically for that person, all right. Um, sure. Turn it on. No, it's not, I didn't turn it on. We both, we have both, actually David has done this, I have done it and Jay has done it where we forget to turn the clicker that's on. Yours. What? No, that's David's. <laughs> so what we're going to do today is it's not going to hopefully be a death by PowerPoint, okay? We're not going to stand here and read off our slides <coughs> and you'll be asleep by the end of the session. Um, we do want you to engage, we want you to ask questions. Um, don't be worried if we fire the question straight back at you to get you to try and find the answer, okay? Um, we're going to talk about audiometry, the essentials of audiometry, um, and we're going to talk about different types of tests that you can use to build up a whole picture. For, so for ideally, we would like you to ask questions and answer them yourself so we can all go home early. That's it, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's easier for us that way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the impact that we would like this session to have on you Okay, and we'll, we're going to ask how this goes towards the end. Is is we want you to think differently about everything because so, we all know that we get into a habit of doing things often the same way. Um, at the end of this session, we really want you to have thought: Am I? What am I doing? Am I doing what I'm? What I'm doing is it enough every time? And if it is, brilliant, amazing. If it's not, then hopefully you'll start to think of. Slightly different ways of approaching things, okay? Um, that's more me there. I'm more of a Homer Simpson. Jay is, the, well, not the woman, but <laughs> more thoughtful looking. <laughs> um, so really, what's going to happen, or what we would like you to do to start with, is I did bring post-it notes with me, uh, but left them in my hire car. And uh, so I've lost them. So you have each have uh, a, s a sheet of paper on your table. I'd like you to get together as a group on your table, twos or threes, and I would like you to think about what you would want to achieve at the end of the, by the end of this session. If it's a clinical focus on the hearing assessment, what things would you like to to achieve? Because if we don't hit it all, all of these in this session, it's what's going to make up a big part of the information we send out to you post this session, and it might then influence further sessions down the line. All right. So. Is that clear enough for everybody? Have a little think of what you would like to get out of this, this session. From a session on audiometry. A session on measuring hearing. Okay. Not just audiometry. Any aspect of the hearing assessment. And there's some pens as well. If you want to wrap up there, and we're just going to note down some of them, so we'll go around each each table, and hopefully there'll be some synergies there. All right. Um, so, shall we start at this table? Uh, an objective that you would. Do you have to? <laughs> what was the question again? Um, <laughs> well, what, you know, what, what would you like to get out of this session? What, what would you like to sort of achieve by the end of it? On a session on hearing on, measurement. On hearing measurement. Okay, so um, we talked about how you use hearing measurement to agree the need with the, the person in front of you. How you can use the hearing assessment to 
forecast an outcome for yourself and the person in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, how you can use it to agree goals and measure outcomes and control expectations. How you can use it to get agreements, take action and to proceed on to whatever next steps mm -hmm. might be in there. Um, it should provide, of course, some basic functional diagnostic data yep. that you can put in the bank and use. Um, it should highlight contraindications. I couldn't say that word otherwise. Um, it should allow you the opportunity to explain the results and maybe push that out to family support and other people in there. Yeah. It should give you a platform to do that. It should allow you to look for um, other issues beyond that that might be revealed by the pure tone audiogram, for instance, yeah. associated issues, needs. Um, it can just be a basic hearing health check. So it might be, uh, yeah, everything's fine, move on. Um, but it can also be allowing you the dialogue of are you hearing as well as you, you could, so it's the kind of that yep. Curtis ice check, teeth check, hearing check thing. Yep. Did we understand it correctly? No, that wasn't the question. No, oh. but, 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 well, I, th I think, well, I think what, 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 what you've described really well there is, is actually what you want to achieve at the end of a hearing assessment, and that's what, I mean, those are the ultimate goals oh, of... It's a happy patient who can hear and communicate effectively. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So let's 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 move on to so back table. Can I can I just summarize it as outcome of hearing measurements? That's that's what we're after, isn't it? In terms of what you what you said in yeah. all the points. <laughs> that that was the job that I was trying to do. Thank you. Looked at the relevance of communication needs assessment. Mm -hmm. um, talks about speech and noise testing, acceptable noise levels, whether you do pre-assessment questionnaires or not, and assessing the readiness for using amplification should it be necessary. Okay. So I'll take speech and noise and ANL from there. Um, communication need assessment is a very important topic, and I think we need to do more in that respect as well. But just to focus solely on the hearing measurements. I'll keep these two. <coughs> and um, David, your table? <laughs> <laughs> um, who was the scribe on, on your table? Oh. Sorry. Um, I was thinking as well in terms of the training as well, so to get a better understanding and how to support graduates and the sessions. So how, how might you take the uh, slightly more complex things about a hearing assessment and actually pass it on to other people, yeah. which is a big responsibility of, of, of all of us to help the next generation come through. So that, yeah, that might be, pa well, passing on information or training. Yeah, okay. There could be, there's some good tools that you can help with that. Okay. That's it, tools. And yours, well, summarize well, we, we can concur with these yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. nothing to good. add to the list uh, we just started to formulate opinion of this, uh, what is considered best practice well exactly what is considered best practice which is sort of the ultimate <laughs> thing we all want to operate under best practice so i, I think sorry i think that we, for years we've been far too much persuaded to the pure tone audiogram and yeah. there are so many other tests <coughs> Way yeah. to really support that individual and the patient's family or whoever they associate themselves with. Definitely. For me, if we're going to re answer that question, what we should have done, it's about, <laughs> it's about <laughs> making sure that we're up to date, totally up to date yeah. as, an, as a professional and from this professional with yeah. the latest thinking and embed that into our daily consultation and not just sit back on our laurels and just say, well, this is what I've done, this is what I've always done and it's worked for me. Historically, yeah. Necessarily Definitely, and I mean the audiogram doesn't give us all the answers. That's the, that's the key thing. And if it did, well, actually, we wouldn't be needed because you can do a relatively okay online hearing test. Dorothy could be sitting at home, push a button, order hearing aids. There's technology there that she could adjust them herself. So actually, we we wouldn't be needed if it was just an audiogram. Yeah. <coughs> 
Uh, before you move on, yeah. your, your opening question to everybody to sit and, and, and talk about and respond to was, what is it you want to get out of oh, yeah. <laughs> And it seems to me that that's an absolute parallel of the starting point of any consultation. Yeah. What, what is it that you want to get out of it? Mm -hmm. Because it's all about setting and managing expectations and responding to that. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So ultimately, we are still slaves to the audiogram. Mostly, well, more so because hearing aid fitting is always based on it. So that's your starting point. So there are some real essentials that you need to always get right. Um, so we're going to review a bit of best practice around audiometry, specifically around masking. And then we'll go into a little bit more about some speech and noise testing and other ways of, of assessing the needs in terms of the tests that you can do. All right, and then we'll, we'll have a, a few case studies to look at to highlight where these extra tests can actually uncover some, some slightly more complex issues. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Jay to do a little bit now. Sure. And Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for your thoughts, and, and they're all very relevant to not only this particular work that we are doing today, but also what we get out of it and what we send you after the presentations as well. And um, I heard all the tables talking about speech and noise test and uh, measuring the needs of the client rather than measuring the hearing itself, uh, which is very, very relevant to how we want to achieve the best outcomes for the clients. But I do think there's a value in getting the bare essentials right. And some of the stuff that I'll present here is probably something that you read 10 years ago or 20 years ago, perhaps. Um, in the protocols that are valid and still there. Uh, but I do not really apologize to going through with all the basics with you today. And the reason for that is very simple, that we, we sometimes tend to overlook or forget things. And these things are not only important for the client that's sitting in front of you, but also are important for you when you're doing that particular clinical assessment. So if I ask you one question, why are you here today. Why do you want to achieve the level of learning that you want to achieve today? Can you give me a few words? I want to make sure I'm always at the, at the forefront of knowledge and information for networking, keeping up to date with people around me as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. Any information we can take on board that improves our service to our clients is what we should be doing. And we want to perform as well as we can for our clients uh, and do the best we can. So we're here to get the best possible uh, and latest information. Can I make an admission? You all are better people than me. I go to an event, I do learning <coughs> to avoid getting sued. <laughs> you know, that, that's my motto of the life. And um, I've learned it the hard way as well that when I do something and when I write something for uh, my clients, my professional colleagues, one of my main mottos is not getting sued. So I want to get everything in the right way in my reports, in my records, and I'm sure David will refer to the records, um, and he will go through that in a little bit of detail in, in that presentation as well. But it's very important that you follow these recommended procedure, however trivial some of the things may sound to you in those procedures. When somebody stands up and says to you that you haven't done the PTA right, the only document that you can refer to is the document that's existing, right? So your insurance company won't pay, pay you if you haven't done it the way it, the recommended procedure will recommend. Although it's not a protocol or policy, it's a recommended procedure. So, you know, a learned society, as BSA would like to call itself, um, and I'm saying that with full responsibility because I'm a member of one of their committees, uh, but they're not a professional body, they're a learned society. They've put forward some thoughts and said that this is the best recommended procedure. We, as enlightened individuals, recommend this procedure to you. You follow it. Some of the things will sound very, very trivial in that protocol, according to your own knowledge, your own personality, and the way you think about the profession. But you have to do it, and you have to prove that you have done it. So you have to record it in a proper way. If you don't, then you haven't done it. If you say what, see what I mean. So 
One of the foremost things, at least in my brain, when I'm working with clients, I'm working for anybody, is that if there is a way that I, I can avoid being sued by the clients, I will do that. And then next thing comes for the welfare of the clients. You know, if, if I get sued and if I have to leave the profession, I can't do anything for them anyways. Right? So that's the premise that I start with. Some of the things will sound basic, and please do bear with me if you know it already. If you don't, if you can pick up one thing that you will do after I finish, then I'll think that I've fulfilled my purpose. Okay, let's start. So that's where is the starting point. 2011, they came out with a recommended procedure. There was a minor amendment done quite recently after the um, some of the CCGs questioned whether uh, mild to moderate hearing loss it should be given um, a chance to have amplification or not through the National Health Services. So there are some wordings around that which, would, which were changed in this uh, particular amendment saying that that's not the thing which determ determines the success of the hearing aid. And actually, um, if you think about it, PTA in itself, probably 60, 70 years ago, somebody in America thought all these people who are coming out from the war and with noise-induced hearing loss, how do you know how much disability they have, how much money the pension departments could allocate to them, and how the person can be supported through the government bodies? That's how the PTA started. We didn't have you know, these hi-fi algorithms to program the hearing aids into, into PTA levels, right? So PTA wasn't primarily program a hearing aid. It was primarily to calculate a number so that a suitable compensation could be given to all these clients. And that thinking is not new, you know. In, in 1948, Hirsch et al, H-I-R-C-H, you know, you'll find um, his paper, who says that PTA is only the starting point. That was 60, 70 years ago, not today, right? But we still, the, for 40, 50 years, we used them with analog hearing aids, with everything else, ear trumpets, and everything that we had for amplification. And when the hearing aids progressed to the level that they have, we didn't really progress in our clinics because we were bound by the practice that we had been doing for so long. And that's where all this trouble about giving hearing aids with the PTA and not measuring everything else that we'll hopefully talk about uh, either in the presentation today or um, uh, when we send the post-reading material and do further events. So let's go back to basics. Five factors. If you shout out five things that you think, broad things, which can affect the PTA. Back seclusion. Pardon? Back seclusion. Back seclusion. Do you affect the results or affect the, the Anything. Whatever comes in your mind when, when, when it's about the factors affecting PTA. Background, Background noise. Patient fatigue. Patient. OK, brilliant. Let Collapse ear canal. canal. I think I've got everything, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> I've uh, broadly classified into five different categories. Test equipment, environment, procedure, patient, and you. You know. Let's go through them. But before we do that, I'm hoping that I can answer at least these questions and some others when I finish talking about what I am talking about today. So what is the most unpredictable factor in audiometric testing? Can somebody tell me? Patient. Patient. You don't need to be here, sir. Greatest concern for the test environment, why do you retest at 1K? And if you do retest, and if it's different, what do you do? Frequencies are, which are affected by occlusion effect, and um, why does masking work? You know, why is sky dark at night? They, you just keep asking these questions to yourself. Whenever you hear something, whenever you read something, whenever uh, people like me tell you something, why, why is what I'm saying? That's, that's the main idea of learning and how you reflect upon uh, a, a learning event or 
of in your life, whether it's reading material or it's listening to d d different talks, etc. So let's talk about the test equipment. Um, most of this stuff has come out from the BCA, BSA protocol, so you'll find that within the protocol. There are numbers of standards which the protocol refers to, standards around what sort of calibration requirement um, the equipment meet to, uh, it, the different stages of calibration that you have to do every day. And again, if you haven't recorded that you've done stage A and stage B, then you haven't done it. So I can't highlight enough the value of putting the records in place, whether it's under your name. What I do is, when I, whenever I open my audiometer, I'll do a hearing test on me and it's recorded on that date. And I know that I've done the stage A calibration test. And I recommend that you either have a sheet where you tick it every day you've done it or every time that you've done it. Um, then the equipment factors such as what is the highest limit of the equipment, um, whether the highest limit above 100 dB, e, 100 dB HL can only be accessed through a special button. Because if you go to health and safety executive control of noise regulations, they will tell you if you are being, if you're going above 100 dB, you have to be careful. And how do you be careful if you are audited? If somebody stands up and says to you that you haven't been careful, how do you prove it? Whether you've got an extended range button on your audiometer and whether you've asked the patient and recorded it that you asked the patient, I'm going higher than this in 5 dB steps or whatever words you want to use. And if they're comfortable with it, what do they do if they're not comfortable? All this has to be in your own local protocols if you want to avoid any questions being asked. Transducer limits. So um, the best way to do it is to do it on 10 of your clients, staff members, yourself, family members, where if you do a little study, particularly with BC, where you start getting the vibration, uh, vibrotactile stimuli in your BC thresholds. So whether you've taken the calibration data, whether you've taken the patient responses into account for that, or if you've done your own norms, all this is very, very important. Signal type, we'll uh, dwell into that in a little bit more details. Um, and the frequency limit, of course, whether you can test up to 16K. So some of the protocols around noise-induced hearing loss testing are quite vague. Autotoxic um, medicine testing is quite vague. Whether you test up to 12,000 hertz or 16,000 hertz or not, that all frequency limit, et cetera, has to be documented in your protocol saying that this is what I can do. And when you refer patient to me, make sure that this is in place. That, you know, if an ENT surgeon refers a patient to me with, with a history of autotoxic medica medication intake, he should know what I can test and what the level of my audiometer is before he sends the patient uh, in, a, in an idle situation. Test environment, um, ambient noise. These are the data derived from the British standards. Um, that roughly translates into uh, less than 35 dBHL at least. Um, so you, if the noise is more than 35, then you stop the test or uh, possibly write it down. The, the test was done under circumstances where the noise was more. Now, usually I will only do, I will proceed with a test if the noise is above 35 in one of my clinics, I have uh, practice privileges in five different clinics and one of them is particularly noisy sometimes. Only if I get normal hearing, then I don't worry about it too much. But I will always have to record if the noise was more than what I was expecting it to be, if it's not a sound treated room, basically. Um, if you use certain types of uh, earphones, then uh, that can help you in overcoming the limit of the noise. Um, now, I can't remember the name of the researcher, but I know that there was at least one study done where they used insert earphones and put hearing muffs over insert earphones and they could measure hearing in up to about 65 decibel of noise. 
right? So it depends uh, what your transducer level, et cetera, is as well. But these are all the um, exact noise limits that the standards will classify if you want to go into it deeper. Um, test procedure, I've purposefully left it there because the procedure that we use, it comes from something done very, very long time ago. Um, so Fechner, uh, as I pronounce it, I don't know whether it's Fechner, um, he gave three methods of basically testing any sort of response, behavioral response, and method of adjustments, um, which I know uh, Bexie's literature, if you read Bexie, and he's tried some things where he will try and get the patient to respond rather than to, to change the levels rather than the clinician changing the level. So the patient has control on the audiometer settings. He will change the, or she will change the level of audiometer up and down, and that's what method of adjustments is. Now, it's very interesting in light of the fact that FDA has very recently approved a um, hearing test device, which you can buy off the counter, take it to your home, plug it in your computer, put your phones in, and the patient themselves can measure their hearing through that device. Um, that was, I think, in November, but very, very recently, under one year. And if that's already been approved in US, I wonder how long will it take to come across the pond? You know, it's only about eight hours away, isn't it? Yeah, they still have to check there to see if they don't have any infections or excessive ones. Yeah, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, but at the same time, there's lots of work being done on the remote otoscopy. So there are at least two companies that I know. One company has actually made it commercially available, Saloscope, um, an American company, Californian, um, who actually give you an iPhone 5 cover. So you put the cover on the iPhone, and then they give you speculi, which you attach with the cover, and you can do remote otoscopy, email that to your physician, and the physician can decide what you're seeing in the ear. So that's already happening. It's not like airy fairy stuff. It's already there, and I think uh, rather than the market adapting to us, we will have to adapt to the market and find ways where our professional services matter in those sort of situations. Your point is, point is very valid. You know, for all you know, you could have wax which you could drag further in. In the ear, you could have uh, sort of um, infectious material which might not be helpful. You could have ulcers in the ear. You know, you could have anything in the ear when you're putting something in the ear. But, you know, if you think about it, it's ultimately people's choice, not an audiologist to tell a person that you can't do it. And I worked in a pediatric department where, you know, if it's a little baby and if they have a hearing loss and if they have a hearing aid, they will have to have ear impressions done quite frequently. Two weeks, three weeks. So the youngest baby that I gave the hearing aid to was two weeks old. And I will see them every week for a new impression. Now, some of the times, particularly when they start getting to the age of two months, they will have wax in the ears because they're wearing the hearing aids and the natural mechanism is not working properly. And the patients will make all the journey to the clinic with a little baby just for me to tell them that there is wax in the ear. And to a couple of parents, I asked them to buy otoscopes. I told them that I can't train you to do the otoscopy. I can tell you the basics. I can't tell you that you have to do it on your baby. But buy it from Amazon. It will cost you about 15 pounds or so. Have a look in baby's ear. If they have wax, there's no point coming here. Come to my wax clinic where I can microsuction. All right. So th th these are the adaptations I think we, we will all have to make according to how the society is, where the technology is taking us. And um, I've just started writing an article on how the audiology clinic will look like in 10 years. And my idea is that everything will be on your mobile rather than in, in big, these big machines in 10, 15 years. But anyways, that's discussion for some other time. Let's uh, go to method of constant stimuli, stimuli which is uh, the ascending or descending technique, the recognized backseat technique. Um, and then method of limits, which we use internationally, I can, I can say with some authority, having worked in three or four different countries. So 
uh, wherever I go, this is the method I find people use because it was developed by Americans who developed audiology and they went into everywhere and trained everybody else in the world. So the technique that we use, 10 dBF, 5 dB down, is modified Huxon Westlake, which came out in 1959 and is actually mentioned in this particular NC. Um, uh, uh, I think it came out in 70s, but I'm not sure, but I'll put the reference at the end. Um, then the clinician and patient, as you rightly suggest, the number one most unpredictable factor in PTA is the patient. And I think all these things apply to both of them, and that's why I've put them under one umbrella rather than two. Uh, we'll go through some of these in, in later details, but it's pretty self-obvious. Um, now, prior to the measurement, what do you make sure? You take history. What do you ask in history? These are the things that you're meant to be asking. These three things are within the protocol. If you haven't documented, you've asked that, you haven't asked that. So you have to make sure that you ask these three things. Um, history of noise up to a week, that's um, what I do rather than what protocol suggests. Protocol will say 24 hours. I'll ask them up to a week because there is some evidence that the temporary threshold shift can last as long as a week. Um, what do I do if I find that they've been to a concert three days ago? I'll just put it on the, um, uh, on the report. If I'm sending it to the ENT surgeon I work with, it's his problem, not mine. Right? So I'll just say that they've been there. If you want me to repeat the test, I can do it in a week time. If I'm fitting a hearing aid, I will probably do the test again and see whether it's matching within 5 dB or not. I will invariably, and I'll mention it somewhere else as well, uh, do the inter-octave testings as well. So uh, 3 and 6 is pretty standard for me. I will try and do everything, particularly if the difference between two octaves is of certain limit. I'll go through that in another sl slide. Um, progressive and sudden hearing loss. What's sudden hearing loss? Anybody? What's the definition? How many hours you, you have to have? 24. Pardon? 24. Okay, 24. You have one candidate for 24. Anybody else? 48. 48? Good. <laughs> 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 But well, I think the natural progression from 2448 will be 72, which seems to be the answer that research will provide. So anything between 72 hours, 0 and 72 hours, if you like, um, of what range? How much the thresholds have to differ by? OK, that's something I'm not telling you. So you go home and do your work. Um, so uh, there's a limit of dBs that they have to be down in two frequencies, three frequencies, and the limit, there's a limit of time before you can say it's sudden. Now the original so. audiograms Pardon me? Now the original audiograms. Yeah, sure. But it, 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 in that case, you just uh, ask them whether they've s felt that there is a it's loss of a hearing. A perception of, you know, of a sudden change. That's right. Yes, I agree with that point. Um, progressive hearing loss. Give me two reasons of progressive hearing loss. Pardon me? Um, yes. Uh, although I'm talking about sudden progression here rather than. So, you know, when you, when you ask about the history of hearing loss um, of, of a client and you want to know how frequently you will have to do an audiogram, you will have to take into consideration certain medical conditions, if you like which can cause more progressive hearing loss Tumor, than many years. many years is one. Tumor. Tumor, other. There are certain autoimmune diseases. Uh, Noise-induced hearing loss, environmental factor. Yes, there's uh, Chiari malformation in the brain. Um, so it's a central problem which suddenly pops up but has been there for a long time. Um, there are so-called idiopathic loss, which doesn't mean that there's no reason, but we just don't know the reason yet, and they will come up. Um, I saw this um, um, eight, year old, eight, nine years old girl who suddenly developed auditory neuropathy out of nowhere. 
So she saw us for about four years before that, and she was fine, and suddenly one day she comes in the clinic and she says, I can't hear anything from the hearing aid. That's what the, the clients will say, isn't it, whether it's small or big. And then turned out that their OEs were present with moderate hearing loss, and their speech reception threshold and speech recognition scores were at the bottom. Um, and nobody knows why she has it, apart from a educated guess that it might be autoimmune disorder, which can pretty much happen in adults as well at any point of time. One of my American colleagues, um, he lost his hearing while he was sitting in a conference in Paris. So suddenly the hearing went and turned out that he had an autoimmune disorder which was precipitating for as long as that. And the best guess was because of the food and environment and everything else changed, it was more challenging for his body. So it, it does exist and there will be people who will have it. I agree with you uh, that we should ask these questions, but aren't you putting the cart before the horse here? You know, we are uh, commercial hearing aid dispensers. We have strict guidelines on where, uh, that if we discover any of the referable conditions, we refer. Uh, we, we, and for the majority of us, uh, that is our business to fit hearing aids uh, there. To, uh, we're not in a primary healthcare position to then to diagnose and treat. Yeah, uh, so I, may, may, are we looking at it? In, 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 I partially agree with that. The, the reason why I mentioned it there is it's not your job or my job to diagnose an autoimmune disorder. You know, we are not qualified to do that. It's not your job or my job to diagnose somebody with wide vestibular aqueduct syndrome, which might be another reason why they will have progressive hearing loss. But I think if you're thinking about the hearing aids, how often will you test the clients? Whether it will be in one year, or it will be in six months, three months, or even more often? because their hearing can change. And how do you know whether their hearing can change or not? Through the history. If you ask that question, have you got any non-medical condition? So if they say to you, if they turn around and say to you, hey, yes, I've got this condition, which my doctor names as so-and-so, and if you know already that that's a condition where the hearing loss can be rather progressive, then you will make your management plan of hearing it fitting, fitting accordingly, where how often you want to test them. So I think, from my perspective, I would still say that it's an important question to ask. Sometimes they don't know about this condition. When next time you see the client, and if there's a progression in the hearing loss, and they tell you that it's not in the last six months, it's not in the last six days, but in six months that I've gradually felt it's going down, and if you write that back to your GP, then I think the GP will appreciate you very much and think that you've got the knowledge for me to be reassured that if I send the person to you, then they will be in good hands. So for that reason, I would say that it still is an important question to ask how you fit it within your practice. That's a decision for you to make, and that's a reflection that you have to do. If I've said something, you take it back, see whether what I said to you will work within your practice, within your protocols, and uh, see where it will be fitting in there if it does work for you. Okay, so, so I mean, an important point raised there, isn't it? Because um, some of the value of you knowing the answers to that depends on the nature of the relationship that you've developed with the ENT consultants. And if you have a close relationship in which you're building uh, a real sense of trust, that, that, then actually you're going to have, <laughs> and, and sometimes you might want that, but the ENT consultant doesn't in any way want to have anything to to do with you or the other way around, but but you know there is something about trying to try to strengthen that bridge between what you do and the others who are part of that patient journey. Yep, good. I've, I've, I always say it: good quality is good business. You know, if if you can provide quality service, then people will come to you rather than you have to go to market to people. And I can give you a very recent example. I was sitting in this um, last Saturday. I do a clinic on Saturday morning and I saw somebody for Simplex. All I had to do is take impressions and send it to Simplex. And um, this guy started chatting to me about it and I started taking some history and he said he gets lots of infections. And I told him that, you know, you have to be very hygienic with it when you put your hands on the swim plug and put it in the ear. 
the bacteria from hand have already gone there and in hot and humid place that it becomes, once you put the swim plug in, they'll just multiply at exponential rate. So simple things like that, how to clean the mold, what's the risk if they don't clean it. He said to me that, oh, I was never told that in last five sets that I've got, so I'm coming to you next time. I'm not saying that I'm the best audiologist that he could see. I'm just saying that if you add those elements into your practice, which actually distinguishes any audiologist from the other audiologist, if you like, or provides the quality, it's good for the clients, it's good for you as well. They will appreciate it and the professionals that you deal with will appreciate it as well. That's the whole point. Um, I think we've covered that already. If um, there's a collapsing ear canal uh, when you look in the ear, so um, you see whether you are getting this unexplained high frequency drop. Or if you can't use the insert earphones, whether well, you'll have to make some arrangement to test that client properly. Um, earwax, foreign body, and other pathologies of outer and middle ear. So if you do otoscopy a few times, which I'm sure all of you have done, then you can pretty much guess by looking at the eardrum before even doing TIM, where, whether there's a middle ear pathology that you, you need to be mindful of. So that's what it refers to anyways. Uh, frequency, this is again from the protocol. So I've taken everything in this particular slide at least, uh, word to word from the protocol. So test in this order, that's what the protocol will recommend. And then retest 1000 Hertz. And coming back to the question, what do you do if it's greater than five dB? You take the more sensitive threshold if it's within five dB, but if it's more than five dB, then you question the validity of the whole test, all the frequencies that you've tested. So whether you need to do the whole test again, if you don't have time, or if you don't have cooperative patient, you need to call them back and you need to record that. That's the 1000 Hertz retest after you've done all the other frequencies. Interoctaves, as I referred to, I, I will consider testing interoctaves. If, you know, the, let's take an example. If the 2000 Hertz threshold is 20 and 4000, is 80. When NAL or any prescription method that you use calculates the gain, it will just take an average on 3K. Does that make sense? So if 2K is 20, 4K is 80, the average will lie somewhere within 30 dB of either side. So that's what the prescription method that you use will take as threshold at 3K. Unless you test 3K, which could be anywhere between zero and 100, you won't get the right prescription in the hearing aid. And that's true for all the other frequencies as well. That's why I sometimes try and do all the tones, if I can, particularly when I'm fitting the hearing aid. Um, there are different rules for different kind of audiometry, as I referred to, if you're doing if you're seeing somebody for autotoxicity, then it might be a different game. And industrial audiometry has different, slightly different regulations as well. So you have to be mindful of the purpose of the testing, whether you're just testing to calculate the gain, prescription gain for the client, or if there's some other purpose. Invariably, when I um, do an ENT clinic, for example, I will always put everything on the report if I've done masking, AC masking, BC masking, if I've done a Weber test, and I find the ENT surgeons really appreciate it because they don't really realize all the symbols are what they are for. So um, if, you, if any of you do any clinic with anybody else, then um, it's a trick of the trade that I can give you. Um, and the best compliment that I got for that sort of thing from an ENT surgeon was that I'm a very durable audiologist. So <laughs> anyways, um, stimulus, pure tone and vowel tones are accept acceptable. Vowel tones, um, what are vowel tones? Sure, so 100 hertz either side of the carrier frequency. Um, they sound easier. Um, 
particularly internet is they're helpful so but when you're using them there's at least some literature in my own practice i haven't seen much difference if you like i'm not sure what's your experience about it but there is literature which says that it can under or overestimate the thresholds a little bit so if you're using verbal terms the protocol says that you write for the frequencies that you used verbal tone for in your report um, the pearl stones and narrowband noise is not advised to be used but um, um, I've never seen anybody using it in adult context anyways. Transducers, so you've got standard TDH 39s and ER 13s and audio scan and B71. Now, um, when we develop the calibration standards for a transducer, we have to be mindful of what's called RAT SPL. Um, uh, and this is something that I always check on my calibration certificate as well, whether I've got the values for the reference equivalent threshold SPL, which just means that we all have different ears. Same sound can sound different in different ears. And when the calibration is done, it's done in 2cc cavity or 6cc mastoid cavity, if you like. And that 2cc is just a representative of average volume rather than volume of each and every ear canal that you meet, that, that, that you will come across. So RAT SPL is more biological counterpart of that 2cc cavity where somebody like NPL, the National Physical Laboratory, will have done measurement, biological me measurement through a research to find out for this particular transducer how much the value from 2cc cavity will differ in each and every year with a sample of 100, 200, 500 people, that, that sort of thing. So in effect, if you develop an app, for example, an iPhone app maybe to do audiometry, and if you want to get your earphones calibrated to that app, you cannot unless you have this value. So specified laboratory will have to do RAT SPL conversion on the iPhone earphones before you can get it calibrated for standard pure tone audiometry. And if you test that, if you check that, whether your calibration provider has Im implemented that, that value in your calibration, that will be helpful. Bone conduction, the standards vary. Uh, one of the things that, again, the protocol mentions is, I keep calling it protocol, but it's a recommended procedure that, that mentions that um, you only calibrate it with monaural hearing rather than binaural, which means that when you're doing the common bone conduction testing, both ears can hear and it could be 5 dB better than, than um, actual bone conduction hearing threshold. By the way, it's done with the, the calibration is done with some masking um, of the bone conduction. So when you do unmasked on one ear, there could be zero to 10 dB difference between the ears, uh, between the actual bone conduction value and what you get from your PTA. Uh, this is the new type of the bone conductor that has come out, Radio Ear 81. I've been trying Guymark to get it and calibrate it with my audiometer because I do like bone conduction testing. Um, apparently, it has very low distortion, which means that you'll get lesser vibrotactile responses. And also, you can do 250 hertz up to 50 dB with this particular model. They tell me it's more durable as well. So, you know, in the B71, if you drop it, you've had it. You'll have to send it back. But uh, this one is more durable too. Um, something more about bone conductor. Placement, you can either put it on the mastoid or you can use forehead. One condition where you will use it on forehead. Anybody? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very valid condition. Do you know, I, I do deal with bone conductor hearing aids as well. And there's at least one model that you can put it in your teeth. It's all one bone. So wherever you put it, the bone vibrates. And Google did some studies on Google Glass, the, um, the computer which is within the glass, 
which uses the bone conductor earphone. They found that this area, which is called condyl area, is the best for bone conduction. So their microphone actually comes here from the ear, and the bone conductor sits kind of here for the best perception of bone conduction. I think they measured about 16 sites. I've got that paper if anybody is interested, only if you have a sad life. Uh, um, but um, that seems to be the best area for bone conduction, according to this Google study. You know, who believes Google? Um, but there are a set of values that you'll, you'll have to convert the forehead thresholds to, which are given in this. Um, and um, you can get vibrotectile thresholds, which were reported as back as um, 1970, um, particularly with the B71. And that's one of the reasons why I'm looking at B81 uh, in my practice. So these are the values that you probably want to keep handy. So if you get anything at that, that level or above, then you know that, because some of them, some of the audiometers can go above that level, but you'll know that that may be vibrotactile, so you want to put that in there. If you do suspect vibrotactile, then you can use forehead placement. Um, airborne hearing, so when you put it on the test ear, if it's louder than a certain limit, then the person can hear through the air conduction rather than the bone conduction. That's why um, when you test bone conduction above 2K, then you can sometimes see about 15 dB airborne gap, and we don't worry about that. Um, when you put those thresholds into your prescription algorithm, though, then you have to make sure that your prescription algorithm is not counting it as airborne gap, if you see what I mean. So the prescription gain for conductive or mixed losses is different than pure sensory neural hearing losses for most algorithms. If you have shown there is an airborne gap on one side, if you do common bone conduction, then the prescription for that ear may be different than the prescription for the other ear. So just be careful how the prescription algorithm, whatever you use, uses the bone conduction thresholds. There's uh, been recently uh, published uh, papers that refute that uh, validity. Uh, in fact, it's printed in the BSHA uh, uh, people uh, recently. I saw that, yes. Um, um, and I, I think with experience, I will probably agree with, with that. Um, but whether I want to use that in my, my own practice, you know, it's our decision, individual decision to, to take. The, the evidence will have four or five levels, how the authorities will see the evidence, uh, whether it's partial or limited, uh, mild, moderate, or um, you know, whether there's some research which has been done in randomized controlled trial and all sort of these things. And I just, didn't want to be in a position where I take that into account and having to justify it to somebody who's questioned me. And for that very reason, I, I, I thought it's a good study and I think we need to replicate that because I suspect we'll probably find it uh, quite uniform with everybody else's experience as well. Um, but that's a good point to note that there has been at least some work done which suggests that if you block the ear or if you don't block the ear, it doesn't make a big difference. So don't worry about it. Who is that authority that might demand that you do it like? So uh, if you say, if I have to produce some evidence to court where somebody's scrutinizing me whether I've done the right thing or not, then the court will be the authority who will measure the level of the evidence that you've used. And the... It's never happened, it? Um, it, it must have had happened in, in the evidence-related cases. <laughs> and so the reason I ask the question is that actually probably any court in the land or indeed any registrative body, i.e. the HCPC, will take the professional body, i.e. Bishar, as the authority in this. So it's actually what Bishar says is important. So if the premise, the early premise of this discussion was, well, we're all too reliant on the pure, to, pure tone audiogram, Perhaps the most valuable thing Bishar can say is we don't care about the pure tone audio. 
because there is no authority. The HCPC don't have authority in it. They don't have any... Intel they would only turn to the professional body. I sit in SCPC's uh, fitness to practice panel. That's what they use if there's an allegation. So if a patient... They use it because the professional body says it's important, i.e. b -sharp. Yeah. I, so if the premise I, was that actually this is important, why wouldn't the most helpful be to, to actually put the pure tone audiogram in its true context? Yeah, that's true. You have to, you know, we've spent a lot of time in the last development event, event as well in explaining why you should think beyond the audiogram and hopefully that's I'll... That's I'll what I'm trying to understand because yeah. you set up the premise of this saying, well, you know, we might agree that the pure tone audiogram is handcuffing us and is therefore stopping our progression as a group of people in doing what we want to do. But the most important body in stressing the importance of these standards and the need to comply is actually B sharp. And so, you know, the most valuable thing you can do is say, well, they're there, but, but, but they're well, not important. Much as I'd like to agree with you. Yeah. Oh, please agree a, with me. <laughs> Don't hesitate. Much as I'd like to agree with that, there is a, um, a there is a level of consensus required between B sharp, E W A, and B S A, at the very least. For the UK perspective, no, there isn't. and that needs to be set in the in the wider context. Well, so the, the time, the place that I stopped you, yes, was when you said the authorities, yes, because that was the bit where I thought, well, hold on a minute, let's yes. let's understand who sets these rules, and there's no, there is no they, yes. it is indeed us um, that which set. We are a part, of, a, a significant but, part of, but can't yeah. act in. Splendid. You know, as a professional body, oh, we, we can can't act. act. We, can, oh, so we can't we can act in splendid isolation. Yes, what we, we have, can. Uh, no, because we're hearing aid audiologists. We have, to. and so we, we our, 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 our test bank is for the delivery of hearing instruments, and so we can, we can lead the way here um, in setting a, a, a relevant test bank okay, that the, suits our purposes. With the premise that I agree with almost most of it that you've said. I will refer back to what we said in the beginning, that when you ask the question, we'll ask you why. So, so what do you think is a good starting point when a client comes to you and says to you, I think I have a hearing problem? What will you do if you don't do PTA? How will you assess where to begin? So that's, that misunderstands my point, because I think the pure tone audiogram is entirely valuable. Yeah. I think for, for countless decades, yes. it has been the, the rock, the basis under which yes. good hearing aid outcomes have done. And so it's as, as, a, as a gathering of diagnostic data to feed into a, an algorithm, yes. yeah, you know, it, it, it is entirely useful. And, and you know, the reason why we use the threshold rather than the super threshold measures is that it's, it is reliable. So if I do an audiogram here today on an audiometer, on a person and, and, and Roger does it somewhere else tomorrow on a different audiometer, the likelihood of conformity is high. So it's, you know, it's very robust and very important. So plan. my small point is that if we do it properly, it has a value. And how do you define that properly? I began the conversation by starting that we have one recommended procedure. But how does it link to the outcome? And we agree the premise of this was, well, hold on a minute, there's so many more things. With, with this particular work that I've shown you so far, I'm not saying that this is the one which will affect your outcome the most. All I'm saying is, if you do it properly, and if you record it properly, there's a value in it. That's all I'm saying. If you talk about how... What I was holding much. you to account for when you said the authorities, yes. and I think it's the way that Bishar acts on this matter that is of such great importance. And if Bishar says that, that Extreme uh, total compliance to the BSA procedures on audiometry is the most valuable thing and important thing that you can do as part of the hearing aid fitting. Then that's what the courts, the HCPC will, will, will that's, the, that's the message they will take. But there are so many other things, of course, you can, you, yeah, you can do. Yeah, sure. I think, I think the point that I was making is that the evidence around this may not qualify for any professional body to to suggest that this is a valid research, you can apply it into your clinical practice day in, day out. To, to be... So 
Sorry, so. bring, bring, bring Sarah's been back. So, yeah. right. um, just with respect to that, the, it's not saying that the PTA is the only part that's important. It's saying that your PTA has to be accurate and it has to be done correctly because if you don't do it accurately and correctly and follow whatever standard it is, then we're not all going to have a, the same test results. My test results might be different to yours and Roger's or whoever else is doing the test in the room. So we need to have that conformity. And we all have to do the PTA to the correct standards, but we all need to understand the standards. Sure. Well, that's a healthy challenge, isn't it? But there is a, there is a really important point that, that, that Roger is making here, and I, and, and, I, and, I, and I certainly don't want to give the impression that Bichard wants to back away from the points that you make. I'm confused about the premise because this, uh, I go back, so I, I don't disagree with what you've said. The standard is the standard and you comply with the standard. Yeah. But the premise of the discussion was we are being handcuffed as a profession by the limitations of pure tone audiometry. Uh, sorry, I, the premise uh, was that the pure tone audiometry is not the only thing that affects the outcome and, does, and helps but It's the only thing we're talking about. You're going to do. But ultimately hearing aid fittings are based on pure tone audiometry, and until we get a point where you can base the fitting of the prescription on something different, then we are almost halfway with the all that we do have to stick to. Okay, so yeah. just to put it into context, and I'm not rubbishing the, the standard, I was the author of those standards on that BSA committee in, in 2011, so I'm not suggesting by any means, I'm not trying to undermine them, what I'm trying to understand is the, the premise uh, 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 uh. The, the premise is that it's the starting point. That's where we all agree. So I'm not standing here and saying that this is how you have to do your hearing aid fitting. The premise is this is the starting point, and that's what I'm talking about today. Okay. So that's important to me. It's, it, it is, you know, BCR shouldn't be the body that says this is how you must do it. They can signpost you to this is a standard, but the risk is that, that, that it is BCR, that being the authoritarian ones that are saying, well, Unless you have, unless you can evidence that you have done all these things, then somehow you've invalidated everything you've done. I don't think that's right. And, and, and I don't think they're saying that either. But I do, I do think there is an important, a very important point to make, um, Roger, and that is that we are very keen to be leading a discussion about what should be the next generation of standards. How do we go That would be a great a discussion to have. How do we go into a place so why in we which we say on? this is the past, yeah. still a foundation, yeah. but we move beyond it. We're very keen for that. But as... Bishar could be very powerful in, in leading that, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah. we have to do that in conjunction, you know, we cannot, <laughs> we cannot put a, a, a barrier around the UK and say we're going to go and separate ourselves from the rest of the world because the profession is a global profession. And so we have to be uh, leading uh, in the discovery process and working with others, but we also have to, it, both internationally, and we also can't leave the BAA and the BSA and, and ignore their perspective on the world, otherwise we just fragment the, the, prof the, the profession even more. What we've got to do is, play a, is um, play a leadership role in, in, in stimulating further discussion. Sorry, can I just stop you there? It's a very important discussion, but I'm conscious of time. So let me just get over with it, and we can possibly have more chat and coffee break or even after that. So um, that brings us to masking, which simply refers to how one tone affects, the presence of one tone will affect the presence of other. Um, most commonly used auditory masking is narrowband noise, which is centered around the center frequency, which is usually the frequency of the test. So if you're testing one kilohertz, one kilohertz narrowband noise will be centered around that between the one third and one half of the octave. That's what narrowband means. Wide bands, obviously, all the uh, tones that come out like this is a wide band stimulus or white noise. Why do one noise mask the other noise? Any pointers to that before I go? Sure. Um, perhaps I didn't explain. I, I'm more sort of thinking about the neurophysiological basis. Why we don't perceive the other noise when there's one noise present in, in the other ear. So if I've got a tone, 
if if I've got a noise in the other ear, why can't we hear both of them together? Why why? Sure. Because the noises are identical or more or less identical. I think that's hinting towards the answer. What I've got is two reasons. One, which is relatively recent, and I don't know whether there's any other paper which actually accounts the cochlea for it. And I think it's significant, and I think there will more research come from there, and there might have been. I, I don't claim to have done my uh, PubMed search properly on this particular aspect. But there is a suggestion that masking occurs due to cochlea, as well as the central nervous system, which has been the suggestion for a long, long time, and I'll refer to that here. There's been studies as, as far back, well, this is more sort of an opinion paper by Brian Moore, who, who probably has the head as the size of Europe, so I usually believe what he has to say, but he's put all the references there in this particular one, where he will account that for um, swamping, so the central nervous system will overwhelm with too much noise when there's a masking noise, which, which makes sense that there's one noise overwhelming the other. But also suppression, so the efferent pathways, if you like, the, you know, there's afferent pathways, what's going into the system, efferent pathways, what's coming back from the system. So we have an active feedback, feedback mechanism on everything that we hear. So things go from ear to the brain, afferent, and they come back from brain to the ear, efferent, which is sort of a reflex mechanism to, to suppress the noises that, that we are hearing. So that suppression effect does account for some of it as well. And then there's uh, there are different auditory filters or <coughs> bands which are responsible for sharpened tuning of the frequencies that we hear. So if you think about it, we've got about 31 millimeter on the basal membrane, but we hear about 20,000 pitches. And we say that place of the sound matters. So that means that 31 millimeter, which is about this big, has to account. One place has to be there for each of the 20,000 pitches that we hear. Or let's say differential alignment, the ability to differentiate pitches is about two hertz, two to four hertz maybe. So about 5,000 different places on this particular strip, which is not possible. And the mechanism for that is something called auditory filters. And that's again, something for you to look into if you're interested. Um, but they work in a very dynamic way to give us the frequency perception of how we hear the frequencies. And when adjacent filters work together, some of that will account for the masking phenomenon as well. I've left this, um, I think this may have either come out to you already or it will go out to you in the post tweets. But this is pretty interesting. Um, physics-based presentation if you want to go into more details of what I was just talking about. Masking rules, again, from the uh, protocol, if the air conduction difference is 40 decibel between the ears, this is not for this rule. Um, with the headphones, or if you're using insert earphones, then it's slightly higher because that's the level of inter oral attenuation on an average or above that. So the, the difference between two ears on the head will account for the amount of energy that you will need before the signal transfer from one ear to the other ear. Um, it's quite an interesting figure though, because if you've got a really, really difficult patient who, you know, whether it's, a, it's an adult or a child, who you know won't sit for as long as you want them to be to do a masking test. And if they have one ear better than the other, so say if one ear is normal and the other ear is somewhere like 50 decibel, and if you want to mask normal ear, there is an argument that you don't have to reach a plateau to mask that ear. You know that the interoral attenuation is about 40 decibel. Their threshold is 20. So if you put it 60 decibel noise in the non-test ear, then they can't hear 60 plus 40, which is about 100, if that makes, makes sense. So you can test the test ear up to 100 decibel. If you put 
normal non-test ear noise about 60, 65. Does that make sense? Anyways, let's move on. I'll spend some more time on that later on maybe, or maybe in the post-read. Um, but that's something that some people will use. It's not there in this particular procedure. So the second principle is that the air and bone gap in the same ear has to be more than 10 dB. If it is, then you don't know where the noise is coming from. Uh, with possible exception at 4K, where it's frequently up to 15 dB because of the airborne transfer. The third rule, which um, sometimes I've forgotten, and I know some people have forgotten, um, so that's what this refers to, where there's airborne gap of more than internal attenuation for the transducer between the two ears. So if one ear has BC better than the better than 40 dB on AC with the headphones, then the sounds can transfer through the bone conduction to the other ear. So the air conduction doesn't have to be different. They're pretty similar, not that different. So if you just look at the air conduction, you won't mask, you won't mask the le left ear. If you look at the bone conduction, because there is a difference, that's where you will mask the air conduction. <coughs> for the left ear if you like.